Chapter Fifteen of the Toxin of Revolt and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Toxin of Revolt and Other Essays by Brander Matthews. Memories of Mark Twain. One. There can be but very few of the countless thousands of Mark Twain's admirers whose admiration was born as early as mine now more than half a century ago in fact in eighteen sixty seven when his first book the jumping frog and other sketches was published and when a copy came into my possession i being then a bookish lad of only fifteen for two score years i read after him as the phrase is and so it is that i have been able to profit by what i believe to be an inestimable advantage for the proper appreciation of an author that of following his work from first to last growing up with it as it ripened and varied and broadened revealing more and more richly the man whose self-expression it was it is a far cry from the jumping frog to the mysterious stranger and the long road from the bold humor of the one to the bitter satire of the other had many an unexpected turning Four years after the jumping frog had appeared, I was elected to the Lotus Club, although I was then still an undergraduate at Columbia, and I have a doubtful impression that in the Lotus Club, then newly settled in its first home at Irving Place, next to the Academy of Music, I saw Mark more than once, gazing at him with the remote respect proper in a youth who had his own vague literary aspirations for an author who had already published the widely popular Innocence Abroad what i can assert with absolute conviction is that i did see him in eighteen seventy five at the hundredth performance of the happy-go-lucky dramatization of his half of the gilded age in which charles dudley warner had been his collaborator john t raymond a most accomplished comedian had identified himself with the optimistic character of colonel mulberry sellers at this performance i not only saw mark but heard him make a speech when he was called before the curtain as I remember it, this was not one of his happiest addresses, since it consisted of little more than his recital of the story of the celebrated Mexican plug, an unbroken bronco, possessing the power of speedily reducing the man who attempted to ride him to a condition of exhausted speechlessness. "'And that,' Mark concluded, "'is the condition in which I find myself to-night. I stand before you now.' quite speechless then in eighteen eighty two lawrence hutton and lawrence barrett frank millet and e a abbey w m lafon and i organized an intermittent and sporadic dining club which we called the kinsmen because we intended to gather in the practitioners of the kindred arts it had no officers no dues and no rules except that an invitation to one of our meetings was to be accepted as an election to membership I gave the first dinner, and at the second, given by Hutton a full year later, I was delighted to find myself sitting by the side of Mark Twain. Then began an intimacy which lasted until his death more than twenty years thereafter. Three or four years later, when Huckleberry Finn was issued, I had the pleasure of reviewing it in the London Saturday Review, hailing it as one of the indisputable masterpieces of American fiction. This pleased Mark and as he somehow discovered that i had written the criticism he took occasion to thank me mark was also one of the earliest members of the authors club of which i had been one of the founders and i served with him on the executive committee of the american copyright league it was during our eight-year campaign for international copyright that my relations with mark became a little strained although fortunately only for a brief period until the passage of our bill in eighteen ninety one no foreign author had any control over the publication of his writings in the united states an american publisher could reprint without payment anything any british man of letters wrote and as a result every american man of letters had to see his book sold in competition with stolen goods we all felt this keenly but only a few of us knew that there were certain london publishers quite as willing to reprint american books without payment as certain new york publishers were to appropriate british books on the same terms 
while we wanted the rights of the authors of the united kingdom to be protected in the united states we also wanted the rights of the authors of the united states to be protected in the united kingdom in eighteen eighty nine i prepared a paper for the new princeton review which i called american authors and british pirates and in which i collected examples of the cruel treatment accorded to certain of our writers forced to behold their works reprinted in england without their permission and often with an offensive mutilation of the original in a vain effort to adjust it to the supposed prejudices of british readers the facts i had collected surprised many who had been ignorant of them and the editor of the new princeton review professor william m sloan suggested that i might get together material for a second paper so i wrote a half dozen american authors who had been maltreated by british publishers requesting them to supply me with particulars one of my letters went to mark and a few days later professor sloan let me see mark's reply which he had sent not to me but direct to the editor for publication of the new princeton it was a vehement protest against my suggestion that the british law needed any alteration and it held me up to scorn for making the needless proposal mark let his pen run away with him and poured ridicule upon me in a fashion which was lacking in consideration for my feelings even if it was not actually wanting in courtesy it was a brilliant letter certain to evoke abundant laughter from every reader excepting only the one to whom it was addressed it was also an unanswerable letter in so far as its inimitable manner was concerned and yet it had to be answered somehow what had aroused the sudden wrath which had blazed up in mark's epistolary excoriation was my assertion that the british law could be improved it being then perfectly satisfactory to mark himself now the british law was better than the american in only one particular no british author could get any protection in the united states whereas the british courts had held that any book first published in great britain while its author was domiciled in any part of the british empire was entitled to the full protection accorded by the statutes to a book by a british subject in accord with the old rule of controversy always to answer earnest with jest and jest with earnest i wrote a short and simple reply strictly legal in tone i pointed out that mark having permanent relations with a satisfactory publisher in london could always run up to canada or slip down to bermuda so as to be under the british flag on the day when any new book of his was to be issued in england then i made it plain that this procedure was not possible for a young writer with his first book often his best and often made up out of contributions to periodicals there was no fun in my response and it must have seemed pretty pale in comparison with mark's coruscating fireworks but i had on my side both the facts and the law i had cause to feel aggrieved that he had seen fit to pillory me in the market-place but i was unwilling to take offence and i was unable to see any reason for his resentment of my studious respectful retort yet i soon heard from more than one of our common friends that mark was acutely dissatisfied and when i next met him he was distant in his manner and i might even describe it as chilly of course i regretted this but i can only hope that his fundamental friendliness would warm him up sooner or later i knew that mark had a hair-trigger temper and that he was swift to let loose all the artillery of heaven to blow a foe from off the face of the earth i was aware moreover that a professional humorist is not infrequently a little deficient in that element of the sense of humor which guards a man against taking himself too seriously i have been told also that mark genial as he was and long-suffering as he often was could be a good hater superbly exaggerating the exuberance of his ill-will his old friend twitchell once wrote him about a piece of bad luck which had befallen a man who had been one of mark's special antipathies and mark wrote back i am more than charmed to hear of it still it doesn't do me half the good it would have done if it had come sooner my malignity has so worn out and wasted away with time and the exercise of charity that even his death would not afford me anything more than a mere fleeting ecstasy 
a sort of momentary pleasurable titillation now unless of course it happened in some particularly radiant way like burning or boiling or something like that joys that come to us after the capacity for enjoyment is dead are but an affront two i did not have to wait very long before our friendship was renewed never again to be disturbed we spent part of the summer of eighteen ninety in the catskills at Antiora, the hilltop park dotted with unpretending cottages which housed a colony of workers in the several arts mrs candace wheeler mrs dora wheeler keith mrs schuler van rensselaer mrs mary mapes dodge mrs custer mrs runkle and her daughter bertha carol beckwith lawrence hutton heber newton and mark twain within a week after our arrival mark stepped up on our porch as pleasantly as if there had never been a cloud on our friendship i hear you play a french game called piquet he began i wish you would teach it to me and we taught him although it was no easy task since he was forever wanting to make over the rules of the game to suit his whim of the moment a boyish trait which i soon discovered to be entirely characteristic but we were all boys together that summer and we invented new ways for discharging our high spirits on the fourth of july we had a succession of sports including a race around the clubhouse mark officiated as timekeeper supplying a host of fanciful explanations why the runners took twice the time really necessary for the circuit of the building he had to admit that the joke was on him when at last they did appear coming back on the side from which they originally started from the first he felt himself at ease with the friendly folk of Antiora, and i think he was appreciative of the high regard we had for him he was a hard worker at intervals and he was then worried by the difficulties in which his business as a publisher was becoming more and more deeply involved but he liked to play especially with his own children making them accept him as of their own age and he also could play with the grown-ups as if he were a child one evening we all gathered at mrs wheeler's log cabin and sat around a crackling wood fire which was the only light in the large room we swapped ghost stories and at the end mark told us as only he could tell it with a marvelous mastery of pause and intonation the harrowing tale of the golden arm the curious reader will find full directions for the proper delivery of this blood-curdling narrative in the paper he called how to tell a story but the reader who tries to follow the precepts there set down will need to toil long before he can even approach the perfection of mark's technique in telling the tale he sat to mrs wheeler's daughter mrs keith for a portrait which adorns to this day the walls of the bear and fox inn companioned by portraits of several of the other men of letters whose stay made that summer ever memorable in the annals of Antiora he also sat to carol beckwith a native of the straggling town in which mark had spent his boyhood for a portrait which is i think the best that artist ever painted it represents mark with a corncob pipe in his mouth generally he smoked cigars of a specially atrocious brand but he kept returning fondly to the corncob of his youth at the players which he joined about that time he protested with all the vehemence of his resplendent vocabulary against the rule forbidding pipes except in the billiard room where cigarettes which he abominated and objurgated vigorously were permitted even in the dining room he was an incessant smoker yet he was wont to say that he never smoked to excess that is he never smoked two cigars at once and he never smoked when he was asleep but Howells has recorded that when Mark came to visit him, he used to go into Mark's room at night to remove the still-lighted cigar from the lips of his sleeping guest. As Antiora had seemed a perilous experiment to its originators, the Baron Fox Inn had been run up as inexpensively as might be, and the partitions separating the upper bedrooms were only of burlap. Mark had spent a night at the unpretending clubhouse, when he had earlier come up to make sure that the cottage he had rented would be comfortable for Mrs. Clemens, and as a result of this brief sojourn, he was moved to declare that the walls of those bedrooms were so thin 
that he could hear the young lady in the next room change her mind that he came up in advance of the family was typical of the care he was never tired of taking to assure his wife's well-being his devotion to her was a matter of daily observation to all of us he waited on her protected her thought for her as though nothing else mattered and to him it did not he treated her as a creature of a finer clay fragile and infinitely precious needing to be guarded from careless contacts if ever in this world of mismating a perfect marriage existed then it was mark's as howells who knew them both better than any one else has told us mark's love for his wife was a greater part of him than the love of most men for their wives and she merited all the worship he could give her all the devotion all the implicit obedience by her surpassing force and beauty of character once and once only did mark mention his wife in print this was in a letter on the bringing up of children which he had sent without her knowledge to the christian union now the outlook in eighteen eighty five five years before our summer together at Antiora. the mother of my children adores them there is no milder term for it they worship her they even worship anything which the touch of her hand has made sacred they know her for the best and truest friend they ever had or ever shall have they know her for the one who never did them a wrong and cannot do them a wrong who never told them a lie nor the shadow of one who never deceived them even by an ambiguous gesture who never gave them an unreasonable command nor ever contented herself with anything short of a perfect obedience who had always treated them as politely and as considerately as she would the best and oldest in the land and who always required of them gentle speech and courteous conduct toward all of whatsoever degree with whom they chanced to come in contact they know her for one who's promised whether of reward or punishment is gold and always worth its face to the uttermost farthing in a word they know her and i know her for the best and dearest mother that lives and by a long long way the wisest three it was in the course of one of our many conversations at Antiora that mark described to me his method of working in writing tom sawyer and huckleberry finn he declared that there was no episode in either of these stories which had not actually happened either to himself or to one or another of the boys he had known he began the composition of tom sawyer with a certain of his boyish recollections in mind writing on and on until he had utilized them all whereupon he put his manuscript aside and ceased to think about it except in so far as he might recall from time to time and more or less unconsciously other recollections of those early days sooner or later he would return to his work to make use of memories he had recaptured in the interval after he had harvested this second crop he again put his work away certain that in time he would be able to call back other scenes and other situations when at last he became convinced that he had made his profit out of every possible reminiscence he went over what he had written with great care adjusting the several installments one to the other sometimes transposing a chapter or two and sometimes writing into the earlier chapters the necessary preparation for adventures in the later chapters unforeseen when he has engaged on the beginnings of the book thus he was able to bestow on the completed story a more obvious coherence than his haphazard procedure would otherwise have attained a few years later when mark published those extraordinary twins whose adventures had been originally combined with those of puddinhead wilson and had been ejected therefrom because they retarded the main current of his narration he confessed the disadvantage of his method a man who is not born with the novel-writing gift has a troublesome time of it when he tries to build a novel i know this from experience 
he has no clear idea of his story in fact he has no story he merely has some people in his mind and an incident or two also a locality he knows these people he knows the selected locality and he trusts that he can plunge those people into those incidents with interesting results so he goes to work to write a novel no that is a thought which comes later in the beginning he is only proposing to tell a little tale a very little tale a six-page tale but as it is a tale he is not acquainted with and can only find out what it is by listening as it goes along telling itself it is more than apt to go on and on and on till it spreads itself into a book i know about this because it has happened to me so many times when he first told me this i ventured to remind him that this composition at irregular intervals had been the method of lesage whose gil blas the most popular of picaresque romances was a prototype of huckleberry finn in so far as it presented an unheroic hero who is not the chief actor in the chief episodes he sets forth and who is often a little more than a recording spectator before whose tolerant eyes the panorama of human vicissitude is unrolled and i was not at all surprised when mark promptly assured me that he had never read gil blas i knew he was not a bookish man he was intensely interested in all the manifestation of life but he had no special fondness for fiction an attitude not uncommon among men of letters he was a constant reader of history and autobiography not caring over much for novels and getting far more enjoyment out of suetonius or carlyle than he did out of scott or thackeray of course he did not need to be familiar with gil blas itself to borrow the pattern which lesage had taken over from the spaniards as this was ready for his use in the writings of smollett and dickens and marriott i took occasion to tell mark that at my only meeting with stevenson a large part of our two hours talk had been given to huckleberry finn and that i had been delighted to find stevenson holding as high an opinion of this masterpiece of veracity as i did i recalled his assertion that huckleberry finn was a better piece of work than tom sawyer not only because it was richer in matter more artistically presented but also and especially because it had more of the morality which must ever be the support of the noblest fiction and i also told mark how h c bunner had confessed to me that he had never fully understood the southern attitude toward slavery as a peculiar institution not to be apologized for but rather to be venerated as virtuously righteous until he read the record of huck's long struggle with himself to refrain from sending jim back into the servitude from which he was escaping if the peculiar institution could so cramp the kindly conscience of huck finn vagabond and son of the town drunkard then it was an institution indeed and it was peculiar when i thought over mark's statement that everything in tom sawyer and huckleberry finn was taken straight from life i recalled a remark made to me a score of years earlier by the man who had sold mark his share in the buffalo express to the effect that mark twain had a very good memory and that's where he gets most of his best stories when i had heard this i wanted to resent it as a sneer against mark's originality but now i know better it may have been meant as a mean insinuation but nevertheless it was not far from the truth mark was always at his best when he had a solid fact to deal with an actual episode of his own boyhood or an experience of a friend of his youth as he told kipling first get your facts then you can distort them mark took the solid fact which may have come to him from another he made it his own and he interpreted it with his vivifying imagination in the ample and admirable biography by albert bigelow payne we are told the names of the friends who gave him the raw material out of which mark made the jumping frog and the tale of the blue jay in the tramp abroad when professor william leon phelps wrote to inform mark that the explanation of elijah's miracle in calling down fire from heaven to ignite the water-soaked logs on the altar 
put in the mouth of Captain Hurricane Jones in the rambling notes of an idle excursion, had been anticipated by Sir Thomas Brown in his Religio Medici. Mark promptly replied that he had got the story from an actual sea captain, Ned Wakeman. And in Life on the Mississippi, we can read the bare account of a southwestern feud which was to suggest the wonderful Shepherdson Grangerford affair in Huckleberry Finn. Here is the explanation of the curious inequality we observe in Mark's work, and of the disconcerting unreality we find in Tom Sawyer Abroad and in Tom Sawyer Detective. Where he lacked the support of the solid fact and had to rely on his own fantastic invention, his whimsicality was likely to betray him disastrously. It was said long ago that the great poets seldom invent their myths, and Mark, who was a poet in his way, was able to achieve the most satisfactory result only when he followed in the footsteps of the great poets. Mr. Payne has told us how Mark took down a true story from the lips of its heroine, and he declares that this provided the imaginative realist with a chance to exercise two of his chief gifts, transcription and portrayal. He was always greater at these things than at invention. He needed to have the sustaining solidity of the concrete fact, which he could deal with at will, bringing out its humor, its latent beauty, and its human significance. 4. I have already mentioned the startling effectiveness of Mark's own delivery of the story of The Golden Arm. As he was a consummate craftsman in his use of words when he wrote, so he was surpassingly dexterous in his management of his voice when he told an anecdote or when he made a speech. The voice itself was a noble organ, strong and flexible, deep and rich, and he had the power of modulating it so as to suggest the most delicate shades of meaning. There was art, and a most carefully studied art, in his seemingly spontaneous utterances. He drawled along, and appeared to hesitate for the word he needed, and then to find it with unconcealed satisfaction. And thus he made his hearers feel that he was merely talking to them in a totally unpremeditated way, and all the while what he had to say had been thought out and put into words, and perhaps even rehearsed to himself, that he might be sure of his rhythm, his emphasis, and his pauses. His method was his own, and he was its master." It was indisputably individual, but I have heard more than one professional elocutionist express delighted admiration for it, devoid as it was of all their paraded devices. It was because he was an artist with all an artist's desire for perfection that he prepared himself when he knew he was going to be called upon. But he did not really require this preparation, and if he was taken unawares, he could speak on the spur of the moment making his swift profit out of the remarks of others. When Sir Sidney Lee came to New York, Andrew Carnegie gave him a dinner to which a score of American men of letters were invited, and half a dozen of us were summoned to stand and deliver. When Mark's turn came, he soared aloft in whimsical exaggeration, casually dropping a reference to the time when he had lent Carnegie a million dollars. Our smiling host promptly interjected, that had slipped my memory. And Mark looked down on him solemnly and retorted, Then, the next time, I'll take a receipt. At a luncheon to Theodore Roosevelt not long after the Spanish War, the colonel of the Rough Riders turned to Mark, in the course of a military reminiscence, and said, As a veteran of the Confederate Army, Mr. Clemens, you will perhaps recall the condition of nervous excitement a man is likely to be in when he first goes under fire. And Mark instantly responded, I know, Governor, I do indeed, and I have the personal peculiarity that I can preserve that condition all through the engagement. His humor could be swift and direct. He was not one of those wits who have to be cautious in taking aim. He could fire at the word, and the bullet sped straight to the bull's-eye. Yet he scored a miss now and then, perhaps because he failed to see the target in consequence of some sudden obscuring of his vision. 
he was acutely conscious of the lamentable fiasco he made in boston when he brought in the names of emerson longfellow and holmes all three of whom were benignantly listening to him i have earlier implied that his little speech before the curtain on the hundredth night of the gilded age was more or less of a disappointment to all who heard it and at another theatrical gathering at a supper given by augustine daly and a m palmer to henry irving mark failed to improve the occasion he did not say a word about the distinguished guest he actually took for his topic the long clam of new england and what was worse this inappropriate offering was read from manuscript i cannot say now how humorous this essay may have been in itself i can only recall that it did not seem at all funny to any of those who had joyfully and hopefully applauded when mark first rose to his feet in all three of these cases his discomfiture was due to his failure to hit the temper of his audience he did not make contact with those whose attention he wanted to arouse and whose interest he was striving to retain this is a condition to which every speaker is subject and it was a condition out of which mark was generally able to make his profit i have heard him deliver a score of after-dinner speeches and only once or twice was his intuition at fault nothing could have been better that is to say more characteristic in its matter or in its method than what he said at the dinner given to him on his seventieth birthday it had his customary exaggeration of course and not a little of his humorous distortion of fact it was all about himself which was entirely satisfactory to us for he could not but be the topic of every speech it was genial and friendly and at the end it attained a graceful dignity which sat well upon him as he stood there facing us with his good gray head that all men knew he closed by telling us there was one satisfaction in attaining the scriptural limit of years there is no longer any necessity for pleading a previous engagement when we prefer to stay at home we need only reply your invitation honors me and pleases me because you still keep me in your remembrance but i am seventy seventy and would nestle in the chimney corner and smoke my pipe and read my book and take my rest wishing you well in all affection and that when you in your turn shall arrive at pier number seventy you may step aboard your waiting ship with a reconciled spirit and lay your course toward the setting sun with a contented heart equally felicitous although in a totally different vein was a speech which he once made in eighteen eighty nine or eighteen ninety at the fellowcraft club an organization of magazine writers and illustrators on this occasion the club had invited the best known after-dinner speakers of new york joseph h choate and chauncey m depew horace porter and henry howland unfortunately for them the president of the fellowcraft richard watson gilder called up mark first of all and mark's speech made it very difficult for those who had to speak after him to employ their customary formulas so far as i know mark never wrote it out and it was not reported i have tried to recapture it from my memory but i am without hope of being able to do more than to indicate its outline well aware of my inability to recover his exact words i did not know i was going to be called upon this evening and you will find me wholly unprepared no that's the truth but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter at all for i've been going to dinners and listening and i think i've mastered the theory of the after dinner speech so now i'm ready at any time to make a speech on any subject i don't care what it is pick out one that will suit you and it will suit me do you really mean that mr clemens asked gilder are you willing to let me choose a topic for you that's just what i do mean mark answered gilder had jean lafarge on his right and augustus st gaudin on his left he whispered to them and then he raised his voice and said very well then mr clemens we would like to hear you discuss the art of portrait painting 
and when the laughter had died down, Mark begun with solemn seriousness. Portrait painting? That's a very good subject for a speech. A very good subject indeed. Portrait painting is an ancient and honorable art, and there are many interesting things to say about it. Yes, it's an ancient and honorable art, although I don't really know how ancient it is. I never heard that Adam ever sat for his portrait, but maybe he did. Maybe he did, I don't know. And that reminds me that when I was a boy, I knew a man named Adam. Adam Brown was his name. And then he told a humorous story about this Adam Brown, an anecdote wholly unconnected with the art of portrait painting. He told it as only he could tell a story, and then he went on in his meditating drawl. Maybe there never was a portrait of Adam, even if painting is an ancient and honorable art. It may not be as ancient as that. And I don't think I ever saw a portrait of any of those old Hebrews, or of the Greeks either. But the Romans did have portraits, carved mostly, not painted. I've never seen a painted portrait of Julius Caesar, but I can recall more than one statue. And speaking of Caesar, reminds me of a man I knew on the Mississippi who had a dog called Caesar. Whereupon he told another story, equally unrelated to the art of portrait painting. But when we come down a little later, we do find portraits in Rome, portraits of the old popes, he went on. And in Germany we find portraits of their opponents, Calvin and Luther. There's a portrait of Luther in the galleries that lingers in my mind as one of the most masterly revelations of character that I ever saw. And speaking of Luther, there was a man in Hartford who had a cat called Luther. And he proceeded to tell a third story, quite innocent of any association with his assigned theme. And that's all I know about portrait painting, he concluded. At least it's all I have time to tell you this evening. It is an ancient and honorable art, and I'm very glad indeed that you have given me this opportunity of talking to you about it. And when Mark sat down, the guests of the club felt sorry for the succeeding speaker, for they knew that the last state of that man was worse than the first. I do not know whether my indurated modesty ought to permit me to record here another speech of Mark's, which I had personal reasons for including among his best. But it is one of the most vivid of my memories of him, and perhaps I have no right to leave it out of those recollections. In the fall of 1893, two score of my friends paid me the compliment of inviting me to a dinner in testimony of their friendship. Charles Dudley Warner presided, and I had the uncomfortable delight of listening to kindly words from him and Howells, from Gilder and Stedman, from Nicholas Murray Butler and H. C. Bunner. Mark was almost the last of the speakers, and he began by saying that, You have praised this man for a great many things, but you haven't praised him for the most remarkable thing that he has done. That evoked the expected laughter, since it had occurred to me at any rate that all the possibilities of praise had already been exhausted. No, said Mark, you haven't praised him for the most remarkable thing he has done. He has redeemed the awful and appalling name of Brander. And he drawled forth my name in the lowest notes of his wonderful voice. Brander. It sounds like the mutterings of imprisoned fiends in hell. Brander. Why, it was months after I knew him before I dared breathe that name on the Sabbath day. Again, and once again, and yet again, he repeated the dread name expounding its dreadfulness with all the multiple resources of his inexhaustible vocabulary, and with every repetition of the horrific syllables, his tones became more cavernous. "'That's what he has done,' 
he has redeemed the awful and appalling name of brander which was good only to curse with and he has made a name to conjure with five after he had followed the equator around the world earning the money to get himself out of debt mark developed an abiding dislike for the dreariness of a lecture tour with its obligation to arrive at an appointed time and an appointed place and to entertain a thousand listeners whether he felt in vain or not none the less did he keenly enjoy talking on his feet when he was not constrained to it we all like to do that which we know we can do well and mark could not help knowing that he was an accomplished speaker to whom audiences always listened with the expectation of pleasure in the course of forty years he delivered many after-dinner speeches in america and in europe and he made addresses more or less informal at many meetings in behalf of good causes when i urged him to gather the most durable of these into a book he wrote back i reckon it is a good idea to collect the speeches when time passed and the promised book did not appear i repeated the suggestion and this time he answered there isn't going to be any volume of speeches because i am too lazy to collect them and revise them but after his death a volume of speeches was added to his complete works a volume which was not as cautiously edited as it might have been the selection was uncertain the arrangement was casual and the reporting was often hopelessly unsatisfactory not a few of his least worthy efforts were included and there were also not a few unfortunate repetitions the volume does contain however some of the most amusing and most brilliant of his speeches printed either from the manuscript which he sometimes wrote out in advance or from accurate shorthand reports it preserves for us the ill-received speech in boston that on his seventieth birthday that on the horrors of the german language and that on the weather of new england but no matter how skillfully the selection might have been made the reader could not get from the pale pages of a book the color and the glow that mark bestowed upon his sentences by the skill of his own delivery and by the compelling power of his personality behind and beneath the words which have been preserved there was the presence of the man himself howells has told us that mark held that the actor doubled the value of the author's words and those who had the pleasure and the privilege of listening to any one of these speeches will recognize that howells did not overstate the case when he declared that mark was a great actor as well as a great author he was a most consummate actor with this difference from other actors that he was the first to know the thoughts and invent the fancies to which his voice and action gave the color of life representation is the art of other actors his art was creative as well as representative if this volume of his speeches had properly been arranged in the order of time i am inclined to think that it would have revealed a change in his tone as he grew older even in some of the earlier addresses amid all the exuberance of his humorous exaggeration there were to be noted now and then passages of exquisite word-painting like the truly poetic description of the ice storm in the speech on the weather of new england possibly these passages surprised most of those who heard them and who looked upon mark as merely a fun-maker not suspecting the depth of his nature his firmly controlled sentiment his sustaining seriousness and not recalling that the richest humor that of cervantes and moliere is rooted in the profoundest melancholy possibly again it was mark's consciousness that this was the way he was regarded by the unthinking majority which led him to say more than once in the later years of his life that he had made a mistake in coming before the world at first as a humorist as a man trying to make people laugh in the beginning he may have been content with this reputation but toward the end he was not i remember going into the players at the lunch hour half a dozen years before he died and finding him at table howells thinks that mark did not greatly care for clubs and this may be so but i can testify that he was completely at home in the house in gramercy park 
and that he relished its friendly informality. He looked up as I came in and said, Brander, I was just thinking of you. I'm glad you and Howells have been telling people that I am serious. When I make a speech now, I find that they are a little disappointed if I don't say some things that are serious. And that just suits me, for I have so many serious things I want to say. Many of those who have written about him have dealt with him solely as a humorist, overlooking the important fact that a large part of his work is not laughter-provoking and not intended to be. There is the Reverend Joan of Arc for one book, and there is the pathetic Prince and the Pauper for another. There is not much fun in the account of the appalling Shepherds and Grangerford feud in Huckleberry Finn. There is imagination and insight and vision, but only a little incidental humor, all the more effective for being only incidental. As Mark himself put it in one of the maxims of Puddinhead Wilson's new calendar, which served as chapter headings in Following the Equator, Everything human is pathetic. The secret source of humor itself is not joy, but sorrow. There is no humor in heaven. Many of those who had followed Mark faithfully were surprised and even grieved by the saturnine misanthropy, as it seemed to them, which they found in the two books published after his death, The Mysterious Stranger and What is Man. This could be the case only because they had forgotten or failed to understand that bitter parable, The Man Who Corrupted Hadleyburg, which has a biting satire not unlike Swift's or Voltaire's. And they had also paid no heed to another maxim in Following the Equator. Pity is for the living, envy is for the dead. This last of his two books of travel was published in 1897, yet this maxim is only a reiteration of others set at the heads of chapters in Puddinhead Wilson issued four years earlier. When I consider these maxims, I sometimes wonder whether we have not here caught Mark Twain in the act of lowering his comic mask for a moment to let us have a glimpse of the actual Samuel L. Clemens when he had come to be a little weary of wearing it as a disguise. Mark Twain was a humorist beyond all question and one of the mightiest of humorists. But Samuel L. Clemens was immitigably serious and inexorably disenchanted. After he had lost a daughter and then his adored wife and finally another daughter, his outlook on life darkened to a barren blackness, and as he had surrendered all hope of seeing them again in another world, the scheme of the universe seemed to him undeniably and inexplicably futile. Howells had recorded his own impression, derived from the unbroken intimacy of the two score years, that Mark was a man possessing many and varied personalities. How many these personalities were, I do not know, but two of them were present to my eyes after I came to know him well. One of them, of course, was Mark Twain, plain before the gaze of all the world, and the other was S. L. Clemens, with hidden recesses of character unsuspected even by himself. Among his intimates he was simple, unaffected, and friendly. With casual strangers he seemed sometimes to feel an obligation to play the part of the professional humorist, and, so to speak, to act up to the character, not descending to untoward jocularity, of course, yet nonetheless yielding a little to the pressure of expectancy. He used to sign his letters Mark, and he let his friends call him Mark. I doubt if any of those who were admitted to comradeship with him in his later years would ever have dreamed of addressing him as Clemens, and still less as Sam. His dignity was indisputable, despite all his frolicsome friendliness. He was kind enough to tell me that he liked the biographical introduction he had asked me to prepare for the uniform edition of his works issued in 1899, and I suppose that he approved of it largely because I tried to divert attention from his drollery, delightful as that could be, to his veracity as a storyteller, to his ethical integrity, in other words, to the more serious and solid aspects of his work. 6. However sad he might be because of the bludgeoning of fate, 
he did not wear his heart upon his sleeve he knew his life had to be lived out whatever its inner emptiness and he took what comfort he could in its more agreeable accidents especially in the world-wide recognition of his position as an authentic american a chief of our literature as peculiar a product of our western civilization as franklin or lincoln he was too shrewd to overvalue contemporary admiration but he relished it for what it was worth i find among my notes from him one thanking me for sending something i had written about him and saying compliments are sometimes pretty hard to bear but these are not of that sort they are conspicuously and most pleasantly the other way although this note came to me in an envelope it was written on a viennese correspondence card decorated with his portrait drawn by a local artist the card itself was an outward and visible sign of the impression he had made in the austrian capital his fame had traveled beyond the confines of our language from the united states to great britain and then across the english channel to the continent spreading more rapidly among the germans than among the french naturally enough at the end of the nineteenth century he was one of the half-dozen men of letters who had international standing it was while he was interned at an unknown austrian health resort that a little group of us at the players were talking about him and wondering where he was and where we could send him an expression of our hope that he would soon return to us i ventured the assertion that he was then so well known that a letter would find him if addressed simply to mark twain god knows where francis wilson at once put that direction on an envelope and asked me to send mark our greetings i don't now recall just what i wrote but in less than three weeks i received the reply well he did the post office here had delivered the letter to his new york publishers who had transmitted it to his london publishers and they sent it to his vienna bankers so that it came into his hands almost as swiftly as if we had been supplied with the name of the hotel where he had hidden himself a humorist is often one without honor in his own country or at least his own countrymen are too completely in the habit of laughing at his writings to spare time to spy out its less obvious and deeper merits in england stevenson and henley rudyard kipling and andrew lang were not laggard in their discriminating praise it was an englishman met in a train somewhere in europe who recognized him and who startled him by saying abruptly mr clemens i will give ten pounds not to have read your huckleberry finn and when mark looked up at him awaiting an explanation of this extraordinary remark the englishman smiled and added so that i could again have the great pleasure of reading it for the first time as an illustration of the interstices in british acquaintance with names which are household words with us joseph h choate used to tell of an experience of his when he was our ambassador to great britain he was dining with the dons of an oxford college and he happened to speak of daniel webster he had no sooner uttered the name than he perceived that it meant nothing to these english scholars suddenly one of the younger men at the far end of the table spoke up eagerly oh i know him mr choate wasn't daniel webster the name of the jumping frog in mark twain's story that was an anecdote which mark himself enjoyed as he enjoyed the dinner given him by the staff of punch in the famous dining-room when he crossed over to england to be the recipient of an honorary degree from oxford foreign nations said a clever young american many years ago are a kind of contemporaneous posterity and when the oldest of english universities stamped mark with its august approval he may well have received this as a prediction of the verdict of ensuing generations other men of distinction among them rudyard kipling received degrees on the same day but mark was the outstanding figure in the ceremony he was the one whom the undergraduates most rapturously hailed and i have no doubt that these manifestations warmed mark's heart and that he reveled in being thus conspicuously set apart from the others i doubt this the less because it was exactly what he had done a few years earlier when he received an honorary degree at the yale bicentenary
on that occasion eight american authors had conferred upon them the right to put lit d after their respective names we had to walk in procession two by two to the theatre where the degrees were to be bestowed mark and howells led off by right of seniority next came thomas bailey aldrich and george w cable gilder and i followed them and woodrow wilson and thomas nelson page as the youngest pair marched behind us we were four couples but to the crowds that lined the streets seven of us vanished and became invisible as soon as the spectators caught sight of mark they applauded they laughed they shouted his name they cheered and mark took it all to himself very much as if he were a king entering his capital for the first time and bowing graciously now to the right and then to the left howells and cable gilder and i all old friends of his enjoyed his enjoyment and accepted our own obscuration as the most natural thing in the world but i have wondered whether the others not so fond of mark as we were were as readily reconciled to their elimination from the consciousness of the throngs that lined the streets of new haven seven one reason why tom sawyer and huckleberry finn are to be ranked among the best of boys books is because mark had the rare gift of recovering the spirit of boyhood with its eagerness and its assurance its exuberant energy and its incessant desire to assert individuality in other words to show off until his dying day mark retained the essentials of boyishness it might almost be said that he never grew up he had the effervescent irresponsibility of a boy the impulsive recklessness which accounted for his risking his money in a rash succession of inventions it is not to be wondered that the name given him by the one who knew him best his wife was youth perhaps tom sawyer is only a little more autobiographic than david copperfield and pendennis as mark himself told me more things happened to the hero than ever happened to the author but there is passage after passage in the juvenile narrative where we can feel assured that mark was drawing on his own store of memories and there is one in particular which discloses a characteristic of tom's that was also a characteristic of mark's as it possibly is a characteristic of the normal boy this is the analysis of tom's emotions when he went to church the day after he had let the contract for whitewashing the fence in accord with his usual custom tom counted the pages of the sermon as the minister turned them one by one then his attention was arrested for a little while by what the preacher was saying the minister made a grand and moving picture of the assembling together of the world's host at the millennium when the lion and the lamb should lie down together and a little child should lead them but the pathos the lesson the moral of that great spectacle were lost upon the boy he thought only of the conspicuousness of the principal character before the onlooking nations his face lit with the thought and he said to himself that he wished he could be that child if it was a tame lion when mark penned that last sentence he looked into his own heart he appreciated that the honor oxford had done him in making him a doctor of letters but he got a more pervasive satisfaction out of the flaming scarlet gown which was the badge of this distinction he wore it as often as he could and he said he would like to wear it always no doubt he delighted in the richness of its glowing color but he delighted even more in the showiness of it for a similar reason he invented the white suit which he donned late in life and which accentuated the conspicuousness of his shock of white hair bristling untamed above his penetrating eyes when he robed himself thus in burning red or in snowy white he was a boy again he was tom sawyer projecting himself into the very centre of the millennium and when mark was thus clothed he did not care whether it was a tame lion or not for he was well aware that he was a lion himself and that all men knew it mark had been one of the seven men leaders of the several arts who were chosen by a ballot of the national institute of arts and letters to be the founders of the american academy of arts and letters and after his death 
the two societies held a memorial meeting over which howells presided and at which commemorative addresses were made by choate twitchell cable and three or four other men drawn from all quarters of the united states in his opening remarks as president of the academy howells ventured to suggest what mark himself would probably have said if his opinion could have been asked as to the nature of the exercises that evening and so delicate was howells understanding of his friend's mind and mood that we could almost hear mark himself uttering the words with which he was credited why of course you mustn't make a solemnity of it you mustn't have it that sort of obsequy i should want you to be serious about me that is sincere but not too serious for fear that you should not be sincere enough we don't object here to any man's affections we like to be honored but not honored too much if any of you can remember some creditable thing about me i shouldn't mind his telling it provided always he didn't blink the palliating circumstances the mitigating motives the selfish considerations that accompany every noble action i shouldn't like to be made out a miracle of humor either and left a stumbling block for any one who was intending to be moderately amusing and instructive hereafter at the same time i don't suppose that a commemoration is exactly the occasion for dwelling on a man's shortcomings in his life or his literature or for realizing that he has entered on an immortality of oblivion as i listened to howells and the half-dozen others who spoke after him and as i felt the warmth of friendly feeling and of comradely appreciation i wished that mark might have had the privilege he gave to tom sawyer and that he could have returned to life to be present at his own funeral exercises what was said by the successive speakers was serious enough and yet not too serious for sincerity and i perfectly understand what howells meant when he wrote me a day or two later that he felt sure mark would have enjoyed it nineteen nineteen end of memories of mark twain recording by scotty end of the toxin of revolt and other essays by brander matthews